Hello again, everybody, and welcome to part three of our Chapter 7 lecture series. This section is entitled, The Ratification Debate and the Origin of the Bill of Rights. The focus question for this section is how did anti-federalist concerns raised during the ratification process lead to the creation of the Bill of Rights? The ratification of the Constitution was by no means certain, and right off the bat, a fierce public battle over ratification ensued, where essentially two opposing camps were set up, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists, and these two camps would form the basis for what would evolve into the party system in American politics. Now, neither one of these camps were political parties per se, as we understand them quite yet, but the kernels of that development were there in this debate over the ratification of the Constitution. The Federalists were those like Madison and Hamilton who favored strong national government. They were the ones who were pro-Constitution, and they were very much more organized than their opposition was, and very much led fiercely by Alexander Hamilton, who was very vocal in his support for the ratification of the Constitution. On the opposite side were the Anti-Federalists, those who were fearful of a strong national government. They were those who were more aligned with the democratic impulse that the elites, especially among the Federalists, were so fearful of. However, they were much less organized than the Federalists were at this time, and the Federalists, the uh, excuse me, the Anti-Federalists really were not so much led by Thomas Jefferson because they weren't nearly as organized as I had mentioned than the Federalists, but the ideals and ethos espoused by Jefferson and those of his ilk really provided the foundation for the anti-federalist ideology at this time. In 1788, three of the most ardent and vocal of those in the Federalist camp published what have become known as the Federalist Papers. John Jay, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton each published a series of essays which were published in newspapers across the countries and were meant to convince the people to support ratification of the Constitution. These papers were some of the most influential political discourses ever written, and the ideas and ideals espoused in the Federalist Papers are still looked to today by both politicians and historians when they are considering issues of constitutional merit. The publication of the Federalist Papers by those in the Federalist camp did garner a response from those in the Anti-Federalist camp. However, as I mentioned before, the Anti-Federalists were not nearly as organized, and their essays, what have become known as the Anti-Federalist Papers, were not as widely or well distributed as those Federalist Papers essays were. The Anti-Federalists generally opposed ratification because they feared it placed too much power with the national government in efforts to correct the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Anti-Federalists believed that the Constitution had gone too far in the other direction. They predicted that the government would fall under the sway of merchants, of creditors, and others hostile to ordinary average Americans. And their biggest sticking point was that the Bill of Rights, or a Bill of Rights, was not included in the new document. They were very vocal about the idea that there needed to be a written Bill of Rights to secure liberties from the government. And this is generally 
couched in this idea of the difference between negative liberties and positive liberties. Negative liberties are those that are granted by God or nature and thus inherent to the human condition and thus those that the government cannot infringe upon. Positive liberties are those that are granted by the government. And if they're granted by the government, then the government can also take those liberties away. And the fact that there was no Bill of Rights scared the anti-federalist camp because they feared that without directly enumerating those rights and setting them down on paper, then the government would have no break on the ability to run over those rights when they deemed it necessary for their own purposes or, quote-unquote, for the greater good. Those on the Federalist side of the fence generally thought that a National Bill of Rights was not necessary. They, their argument was that the state constitutions had enshrined most of the rights that would be enumerated within a National Bill of Rights. Therefore, a National Bill of Rights would in some sense be redundant or superfluous or, or what have you. However, the Anti-Federalists generally feared this still. The, I, even though those rights were enumerated in most of the state constitutions, because they weren't enumerated in the federal constitution, there was the concern that due to the inherent supremacy of the federal government over the state governments, that the federal government could intercede in the respect of those rights as enumerated in those state constitutions. So, in efforts to reach another compromise and get the Constitution ratified in all of the states, the Federalists did acquiesce and agree to accept a Bill of Rights as an addendum to the Constitution in order to get it ratified. And what has become known as the Bill of Rights essentially comprised those first ten amendments of the Constitution. There were many more than that actually proposed, but they finally settled on ten as being the core of what has become known as the Bill of Rights. And these ten uh, amendments very much offered a definition of unalienable rights, the idea of those negative liberties that could not be infringed upon by the government. The most remarkable of these, believe it or not, was actually the recognition of religious freedom, which was a complete departure from president. Uh, from precedent, excuse me. It cannot be overemphasized how integral that religion was to the lives of ordinary people throughout history up until this point, and how closely intertwined government and religion had been for millennia at this point. So the recognition of religious freedom and the separation of religion from government was a fundamental alteration of that paradigm and something that we in the modern, more secular world often have a hard time understanding. We kind of take it religious freedom for granted and don't really understand just how much religion influenced the lives of past peoples up until this point. The Bill of Rights also did much to establish freedom of expression in general as a cornerstone of the popular understanding of American freedom itself. The Constitution was actually ratified by specially elected conventions in each state. The state legislatures did not ratify these. They actually called for a new election where delegates were selected in the, each district of the states to convene at a state constitutional convention to decide whether to ratify the Constitution or not. The Constitution needed nine states 
ratification in order to officially go into effect, and by 1788, they had reached that non-state threshold. But there were still several states that had not yet joined the Union. So for at least a couple of years there, during this ratification process, there were several states that had not joined the Union and were technically completely free and independent as the Articles of Confederation had been abrogated or tossed out by the writing of the Constitution. North Carolina actually was the second to the last state to actually ratify the Constitution, and it, it did not do so until 1789. That's it for part three of our Chapter 7 lecture series. As always, study hard, and I'll see you soon.